While 75% of organizations believe their practices and policies and strategies are really customer centric, only about 30% of their customers do. And so that means that there's really been an empathy. So um, it looks like a lot of steps to create a persona, but they go pretty quickly. And I think one of the themes that you can see across all of these steps is that communication is critical and building a sense of um, community around personas is really important to making sure that they end up being durable and being used over time. So, Hello and welcome to this presentation today about personas and empathy maps, which is really a discussion of how to create compelling conversations that can drive insights that enable you to create compelling experiences for your users. So I wanted to start today by just setting the stage, uh, giving a little bit of context around who it is that I am and, and why it is that I'm so passionate about personas and empathy maps. So um, over the last 20 years or so, I've done a lot of work around uh, UX or user experience design and research with a focus across a lot of different industries. I've led research teams at 4C and here at user testing and also teach re user research methods uh, at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And um, I really am a strong believer in the power that using a mixed methods approach to create compelling insights that enable people to understand their users and then design really great experiences for them. So to set the stage for today, um, what I'd like to do is first define what personas and empathy maps are, and then arm you with strategies to help you to convince your teams of the value of them so that they adopt and use them, and then also how to create them um, using both qualitative and quantitative data. So I did want to set the stage by essentially acknowledging the fact that, yes, we find ourselves in this new world where it's even more important to create connection with customers. But the other piece is that before we had the challenge of COVID-19, there was already a disconnect between organizations and their customers. So while 75% of organizations believe their practices and policies and strategies are really customer centric, only about 30% of their customers do. And so that means that there's really been an empathy gap. And that's been driven based on the fact that we've set up this barrier between ourselves and our customers of data. So digital transformation has caused us to lose our connection a little bit with people, but our customers still want that human connection. They want a genuine projection of empathy um, from the companies that they do business with. This has become even more important in this new setting where, you know, due to the pandemic, especially here in the United States, but this is true globally, we're traveling less or doing so more locally, we're spending more time at home, doing our work and our schooling from home, and then also do, using more screens and more technology in order to mediate our relationships with the businesses that we, that we do business with every day. And what that means is that we're seeing some unprecedented disruption around how people are using technology. There are more people using technology that never did in certain contexts before. Like, for example, we're seeing a lot of older people here in the United States doing their grocery shopping using their cell phones who have never done that before. But we're also seeing people who are, have already adopted technologies using them in a different way. So that means that it's more important than ever to dig in and understand the people who are both new as well as um, continuous users of the uh, products that we've been creating for them over time. So let's start out with a definition of what a persona is. They're really uh, fictitious models that are based in the reality of what it is that we learn about their behaviors, motivations, and goals 
attitudes um, that help to guide us as we are developing product features, navigational elements, interactions, even visual design approaches. So while the personas themselves are fictitious, they're based in real data, both quantitative and qualitative. So uh, Alan Cooper actually popularized the term and developed this concept of the persona um, and, and public in his book that was published in 1999 called The Inmates Are Running the Asylum. And he spends chapter six really talking about the fact that, you know, creating a picture, a mental model for a design team, you know, composed of researchers, uh, developers, software uh, engineers, product managers, um, everyone who is involved in a stakeholder in a project helps you to keep yourself honest in terms of making design decisions and feature and function decisions that are based in reality rather than we think they might like this. So he set out the goal-driven persona, which is really focused on what does the user that we're designing for want to do with your project. And there it isn't a typical user in the sense that it's an average person, but a typical user that is a segment of users, a particular type of person. And so you're really thinking about the processes and the workflows that are optimized for them. But then there are other personas as well that have been developed, such as the role-based persona, which is very similar to the goal-based persona, but also um, very business-oriented. So here's where you might think about creating personas that are focused on managers versus administration. You know, people who are really focused on the back end versus, um, you know, supporting, for example, a particular system versus the front end users. Then we also have engaging personas, and these are really popular for designers. And so you're thinking about creating a very realistic 3D picture that's very narrative driven, that helps you to understand the emotion and the background and psychology so that you can create really compelling designs for people. And then there's also fictional personas. And, and these are really helpful in cases where you may not have immediate access to the data. You might come up with a fictional draft persona that gives you a sense for what it is that people need and want, um, but maybe something that you come up with in an hour or two, um, and then you can later validate with real data, but at least gives you a, a running start in understanding what your customers' behaviors and goals and needs are. Here's what a, a persona can, can look like and what they, what they typically uh, include. So we see personas have, have a picture and a name, and there's been a lot of discussion actually over the last several years about um, whether or not you really need to have uh, a name and a picture. Some companies find them to be very useful in terms of helping to uh, enable people to create a, men a mental model. And some organizations uh, prefer not to use gendered um, or gendered personas or use names because that ends up being a distraction for them. Um, my personal feeling is that you should pick an approach that works for your team. And that means thinking about the components and the attributes of the persona that are going to help your team to make decisions and that seem real to your team. So you will have information in a persona that might talk about what are the sorts of things that your persona wants to do. Um, what are their influences? What are their challenges? What's their technical level of acumen? Um, what are the things they enjoy doing that might um, become better if you create a feature or function that supports an unmet need that they have? So this is an example, but it's by all means not the only way that you can de deliver on personas. Um, and in the last example, there's also the archetype of the user who would never use your system. And this is useful because, again, it helps to keep your team honest because it helps you to understand what are things that somebody who would never use your system 
um, expect to, to see. Um, you would think about um, potentially using this in cases where you have a software developer who wants to go and create something that is very much an edge case for your core segments um, that you're thinking about. And, and it can be a great way to, to keep you focused and on task. So there are some other frameworks and concepts that you might have heard that are related to personas. There are marketing personas, and we'll talk a little bit about those in a moment, but there are also the mental models by, by Indy Young um, framework and also jobs to be done that can give you a lot of uh, sympathy, empathy, uh, understanding of what it is that your users need. So why would you want to do um, to go through the exercise of creating personas. So they're authentic people, um, but they are not actual users. So you're not actually trying to go out and do interviews with people and then use that information word for word to create a persona. Um, but they really help you to get a good understanding of, of in general, what it is that they need and want. Um, and help to push you. I think one of the things that we are often thinking about as designers right now is how can we make this design inclusive for uh, all the, pe the people that we see potentially using this platform. And by driving consensus and communication, by creating a representation of the broad range of needs that your, your user might have, like how they might push your system to, to the limit, um, it helps you to get an understanding of how effectively you're meeting the needs of your users. So the other piece that you have to think about is that sometimes personas get creative, but or, or get created, but they don't necessarily end up getting used all the time. And so you have to think about what are the ways that you're going to keep personas top of mind for your design teams. And um, some of the things that you might think about are creating persistent reminders in space. So, you know, in the days when we had offices, we would often see uh, posters of personas or um, in those offices that had digital screens, representations of those personas, sometimes being used with real live data to help show, you know, kind of how are these people experiencing our products on, a, on an everyday basis. Um, so essentially what you want to do is make sure that you stress test your personas so that they actually become a, an artifact that people use all the time. Some teams will actually use the names of personas you know, as they are introducing themselves in meetings. So usually teams will create three to five personas that help to approximate, you know, the broad range of, of user segments that their particular product or feature is designed for. And then over time, those uh, personas end up being something that you integrate into the conversation. So you might say, would Lee like this? Um, particular feature or function, how would Lee use this? And you can run through exercises that really help you to interrogate the design choices that you're making. So the other piece is that personas are one of the great living documents that you can use in an agile environment to help to inform the work that you're doing. So sometimes you want to think about what is your strategy going to be to integrate making personas, which do take some time to make, into the already very busy day and very packed schedules that you have. So the, the best advice here is don't overinvest time, spend the right amount of time for you. And so it might be that the best approach for you is to essentially create a draft persona and then use a series of interviews conducted over time, maybe several months even, to help to validate and edit them and revise them to become more realistic uh, with that data that you collect about them. Um, the other piece is really think about before you start a particular project, have a print, uh, have a sprint zero that's really focused on 
making sure that you create a mental model and a, and a persona of, of who it is that your users are so that as you are planning the subsequent sprints, you are prioritizing those features and functions uh, in a way that aligns with what their needs are. And then again, design them in a way that uh, aligns with what their needs are. So, um, there's uh, a few pitfalls potentially that teams uh, fall into when they're designing personas. So the first piece is that you might have uh, a composite. And again, you're not looking for averages, you're looking for real stories. Nobody has two and a half children, right? So really think about what's realistic. You don't want to have stereotypes. You want to have motivations that are really based in reality and not, you know, uh, archetypes that come out of psychology. Um, the other piece is that personas need to evolve. So typically we see that organizations will create personas annually or revise them on at least an annual basis to keep up with um, changes in the industry, the marketplace, and how it is that people are living. Um, I would say this, these days we are seeing uh, companies actually invest a lot of time in evolving their personas because they've got new people using their, their, their tools and because they're busy, um, they're doing research monthly even to get an understanding of how it is that people's needs are changing over time and then also just to make sure that they're keeping a pulse on what the needs of their users are. I think probably the biggest piece that uh, resonates for me uh, is making sure that you're not putting useless trivia into your persona. You really want to focus on information that's actually going to help you in your decision making. So if there's anything in there that isn't going to help to drive decision making, it should be left out of the persona. So let's give you a sense of what you're not going for first <laughs> so this is these are marketing personas and they're really about a very high level kind of understanding that are not as deep as what it is that a ux designer and other product stakeholders really need so you can see they've got demographic information and some identifiers that people have uh, but it doesn't really get to what are their needs, intentions, goals, motivations, that sort of thing. That's more common in the UX persona. So um, it looks like a lot of steps to create a persona, but they go pretty quickly. And I think one of the themes that you can see across all of these steps is that communication is critical and building a sense of um, community around personas is really important to making sure that they end up being durable and being used over time. So you want to make sure that you're collecting all of that data. You want to sit down with your stakeholders and talk about what it is that you've learned based on that data. You want to build acceptance and decide how many of them you're really going to develop fully. And as I said, typically we see organizations looking at about three to five. Um, for their particular products. Um, then you actually invest the time to design and build the personas. These are, this is an exercise that you might choose to have your designers take part in and be an active contributor in creating the actual visuals and deliverables. But there are also software programs out there that actually are templates that you can enter information into and update it, and they will present you with very aesthetically pleasing personas as well. Then you also want to build scenarios. And what scenarios are is realistic context of use stories. So it will essentially be a paragraph that walks you through how would people actually use a core feature or function that's being created for their needs. Then you want to make sure again that you're going back to your team and saying here's our work. How does this resonate for you? and making sure that you integrate that persona into the life of your team. So bringing together information means that you have to create a holistic story that includes behavioral data. So if you have a live product, what are people doing? How many of them are doing it? 
then you can also draw in information that is about their uh, self-reported attitudes and behaviors and intentions and perceptions. And you can also use empathic data or qualitative data. So that's the sort of information that you collect using interviews primarily or usability tests to be able to fill out that picture and inform that behavioral and attitudinal data. So basically in a perfect world, you are pulling real data that is based in true behaviors, real data from surveys that that captures what it is that people are thinking and feeling and intending their perceptions and then rounding out that picture with empathic data. So I wanted to show you a few more examples of what personas can look like so that you can get a sense for some of the options that you might consider. 